Okay, so the the last few lectures have served as a uh, broad overall introduction to graph theory, and so what we're going to be doing for the next uh, several lectures, probably at least the next week, possibly longer, is talk about problems related to uh, paths through graphs. Uh, and so there there are a variety of, of very interesting problems that show up in, in a lot of applications that involve understanding like different kinds of, of paths through a graph from say one vertex to another. For example, if you have two vertices in a graph, is there a path from one vertex to another? How many paths are there? Uh, later on, we'll be looking at, at certain modifications of graphs which have weights on them, which are typically called weighted graphs. And the question then will be, well, what is the, what is the, the optimal path from one point to another that, that takes into account the weights and that has like the smallest cost? Uh, and so to, to begin talking about these topics, we have to first, again, introduce everything, define everything uh, rigorously. Uh, and so, so this lecture is just going to be a, a very basic introduction to the, the mathematical concepts we need to talk about paths. Uh, and so one, one sort of very, very uh, connected property uh, of a graph is, is the notion of, of connectedness. So we'll be talking about connectedness as well, uh, or connectivity. Okay, and so let, let me just begin with the, the formal definition of a path, right? So what, what is a path? Well, let's suppose we have a graph G. Uh, for now, let's suppose that G is, is undirected and we'll modify this as we've done before. We'll modify this for directed graphs uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, so a, a path of length N well, it's just going to be some, some, I mean, it's exactly what you would think a path would be, right? You start at one point, you travel along the edges of the graph to another point, and the length is just going to be the number of edges that you traverse, uh, right? So, so how do you say that formally? Well, it's a, it's a sequence of n edges, which let's say we, we call them E1, E2, up to En. Uh, such that you you have if you travel you travel along the edges and you, you get a, a subgraph of, of the graph right so let me let me draw a picture uh, right so let's say I have some point x zero which I'll call u and then maybe e one brings me from x zero to x one and e two brings me from x one to x two and and so on right. Right, and then eventually I'll hit the point xn minus one, and then the final edge in my list en will will go from xn minus one to xn, which I'll call v. And so this is an example of a, of a path from u to v. Okay. And so in order for this to to make sense for my graph, I want I want this to be a subgraph, right? So a path is a sequence of edges such that the picture that I drew is is a subgraph of of my original graph. Right. And so what another way to, to say this a little bit more precisely is right, so there's a there's a sequence of vertices, which I already labeled in the picture. Uh, say x0, x1, x2, up to xn, uh, with well, my starting point u is x0. My ending point V is Xn, and then the intermediate points are all connected by the edges that I fixed originally. So EI is, is an edge between, uh, well, look at the picture between Xi minus one and, and Xi. Okay. Right, so this is the kind of like formal rigorous definition of what, of what a path is. And the, the important thing is, I mean, this, this maybe is kind of redundant or, or obvious in, in any example, which, which uh, is definitely the case, but uh, you, you want the path to be a subgraph, right? You don't want your path leaving the graph, uh, if that would, would make sense anyway. Uh, right, and so, so what are some, some examples? 
All right, so let's just draw one. Let's begin by, by with one, one easier example. So let's say my graph is the following. All right, so this graph will have four vertices. Uh, well, in this graph, you have a, you have a path from, from U to Z, where you just begin at U and travel along to Z. And so what is the length of this path? Well, you have, you, when you travel from U to Z, you, you cross through three edges. So this is a path of length three from U to Z. Right, and so the path is just, you, you move along this one, this one, and, and this one, right? Okay, and so let's look at some more examples. So let's say I have another graph, which is given by, by this picture. Uh, sorry, I wanted to add one more. All right, so now I have a graph with these five vertices. Uh, so what are the what are the different paths in this graph? Uh, well, let's let's look at, for example, paths from from U to Z. Right, and so the claim is well, there there's paths of length two, three, and four, right? There's always gonna, they're, they're not always, but there can, in many examples, be, be different ways to find paths from one, one vertex to another. And so in this case, we have paths of length uh, two, three, and four from U to Z. Right, so for example, what's a path of length two from, from U to, to Z? Well, I travel from U to X, and then from X to Z, right? So that's a path of length two. Uh, what's a path of length three? Well, I can travel from U to Y and then Y to W and then W to Z. So that's a path of length three. And then finally, what's a, what's a path of length four? Well, I can travel, for example, from, from U to X and then X to Y, Y to W and, and W to Z. So that's a, that's a path of length four. Right, and so one more important definition. So suppose suppose you have a, a path of length n in a graph, and suppose that the starting point and the ending point are the same. Uh, so with with not n, sorry. Uh, so it starts and ends. Uh, at the same vertex, so for example, u, right? So the, the same starting and ending point. Uh, so these are usually called circuits or, or cycles. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's called a, a circuit. So in our book, they're called circuits. If you look at other books, you may see them referred to as, as cycles. Uh, uh, right, so for example, in the, in the picture I just drew above, there, there is a cycle from, from U to itself, right, because I just travel along, I ignore the middle edge and I just travel, for example, from U to Y to W to Z to X to U. And so this is a cycle of length or a circuit of length of length five, right? So the, uh, the, the length is just the same notion as the, as the length of, of the path. So a circuit is just a particular type of path where, where the ending point happens to be the same as the starting point. Uh, and so it's also called a, a, a simple circuit if you only cross each edge or you only traverse each edge exactly once, right? So this is uh, a circuit is called simple. if each edge is only traveled once. Right, so exactly one time. Right, so for example, if I, if I look at the above picture, uh, 
well, if I do u to y to w to z to x to u, this is a, a simple circuit of length five. Right, so what's an example of something that's, that's not a simple circuit? Well, let's say I do uh, u to y to w to z to x, but then I don't go back to u, I go from x to y to u, right? So that this is, is, is a circuit, but not, not a simple, right? So this is not, not simple. Even though it is, it is a path, so it is a, it is a, a circuit since it has the same starting and ending point, but you, you travel the edge connecting U and Y twice, so it's not a, not a simple circuit. Okay, so that's, that's a summary of a basic definition of what paths are for an undirected graph. So how do you make this work for, for directed graphs? Well, their paths are going to be defined in basically the same way, except you, you have to require that the edges are consistent with the directions, right? So it's defined using the, the same definition. So you can just go back to the previous page. Uh, it's defined in the same definition, sorry, defined in the same way. Uh, but, but the edges need to be uh, need to be consistent with the with the directions, right? Meaning you can't travel against the given direction. Right, so if you go back to the, the previous definition, uh, your edges EI are uh, from XI minus one to XI. Uh, with the direction taken into account, right? So, so EI has XI minus one as its initial vertex and XI as its terminal vertex, right? So you can't go backwards unless, unless the graph allows you to. Right? Uh, so for example, right, let's say, just give me a second to copy the, this graph. Uh, it's similar to the example we had on the, on the previous page. Right, so right, and so let's add some directions to this graph. So I'm having say say these directions. So now this is a directed graph. Uh, well, in this case, well, how many paths are there from u to z? Well, there's only. Remember when we looked at the undirected version of this graph, we had many different different paths from u to z. In this case, there's only one path from u to z. Right, because whenever you follow a path, you have to, your path is only allowed if it follows the directions of the arrows. And so what is the, the path from u to z? Well, I have u to x to y to w to z, right? And so the length of this is four. Right? So for example, in the, in the, when we looked at this, this example earlier, we had, we also had paths of length two and three, but when we added these, this particular choice of directions, there's no path of length two and there's no path of length three for this example. Okay, okay. and so, and otherwise everything is, is the same. So it's just a, a small modification, which is the most, the most natural way you can, you can modify this. Okay, and so what, what, is, what are some examples of where understanding paths show up in practice. Well, well, there's one example that, that a lot of people are probably familiar with in, in one way or another. And so this is the, the example of a collaboration graph. Uh, and so one, one famous example of this is something called a, an Erdos number. Right, and so this is named after a mathematician, Paul Erdos, who did a lot of work in, in graph theory and combinatorics and, and number theory. And he's famous for, for writing, basically publishing more papers than basically any other, any other mathematician in history. He had thousands of, of publications. Uh, 
And so, well, there's a there's a there's a graph associated to this, uh, which is an example of something that would be called a collaboration graph. And so, what are what are the vertices in this graph? Well, the the vertices are going to be mathematicians or computer scientists or physicists who have published a research paper. And so what are the edges? Well, two people are connected if they've collaborated on a paper, if they've written a, a research paper together. Or if they've, they've co-authored a, a paper. Right, and so what, what is the Erdos number? That This is the, the length of the path from any, any particular person to Erdos on this graph. Right? So the, the Erdos number of say, let's say a person A is the, the length of person A, or length of, of, small, of shortest path from A to Erdos in the graph. Right, so meaning, right, so say you, you write a paper with, with someone and then that, that person wrote a paper with, uh, with Paul Erdos, then your, your number would be two, right? Because you have to travel one edge to get from you to that other person and then one other, one other edge to get from that person to, to Erdos, right? And so since, since this person wrote, was famous for writing so many papers, there's, there's a very large number uh, of research scientists who have relatively small Erdos numbers. Uh, for example, mine is is equal to four, and I've only been doing like math research for like three, three, three and a half years. Uh, right. uh, so there's also an example of this, which is pretty famous in in the movies. So there's something that's called a, a Bacon number, which is like the the collaboration, the length of the shortest collaboration path from a particular actor to Kevin Bacon because he's appeared in in a lot of movies. And so the book actually has some some charts listed out with, uh, I guess, up-to-date numbers for Eridos and Bacon numbers when, when that edition of the book was published. I mean, they're, they're probably no longer accurate because people publish very quickly and, and movies are released very quickly, but, uh. right. So this is one, one, one sort of a simple example where, where paths will show up in, in something that, that everyone has probably heard of in, in one way or another. Uh, we'll be looking at more, more complicated examples soon. Uh, right, and so so this is again a basic introduction to what pads are. And so, in order to talk uh, in a little bit more more detail about some of the the topics related to pads that that are interesting, we also have to talk a little bit about about connectedness of graphs. Right. And so what, what, well, what, is, what does it mean to say that a graph is connected? So this is a, a geometric notion which sort of means exactly what, what you think it was. So it, whenever, whenever you're, you're introducing this, this notion of, of connectedness, which is an important concept in a variety of, of different subjects in math, it usually helps to, to just draw a picture. And the picture usually captures the, the, important, uh, the important content. So what is, what is an example of, of a connected graph? Well, this graph G1 is an example of a connected graph. So you want to think it's in, it's in one piece. All the pieces of the graph are connected by edges. What's an example of something that, that's not connected? Or, well, another way to say this would be disconnected. Uh, well, if the graph is broken into two pieces, right? So maybe there's one piece that looks like this, and then maybe another piece that looks like this. Right. So this is a disconnected graph. And so one thing to, to point out is that, well, if it's, if it's disconnected, you can always separate it into two different graphs, which have no interaction among, among themselves. Right. Okay, and so what's, what's the, the formal definition then? Well, a graph uh, 
let's say let's again let's let's only begin with with undirected and then we'll modify this to make it work for a directed so an undirected graph g is connected uh, if there is a path between every pair of, of distinct vertices. Right. right, not just between one pair, but between every pair of distinct vertices. Right, so this notion of, of a path, which we just defined earlier in the lecture is used to, to define connectedness. Right, so for example, if you look at, at the graph G1 above, uh, every single, no matter which two vertices you pick in this graph, you can always find a path from one to another, right? Uh, however, if you, look at, if you look at the graph G2, right, so for example, let me pick this, this vertex here, which is V, and maybe this vertex here, which I'll call U, uh, well, there, there's no, no path from B to U, right? Right, any path that starts at V has to stay inside this, this red circle region. And also any path that ends at U is also has to stay inside this, this red circle region, right? And so there's no, there's, no way to, there's no connection between the two pieces. And so in that case, we would say they're not connected or they're disconnected. Uh, Right. Okay, and so in general, like there are plenty of examples of graphs which which are not connected. And so if a graph is not connected, well, notice that the the two pieces in this example G two above that I circled off. Well, the, if you look at the two different graphs that are connected, or sorry, that that are are uh, that are broken up into into the red circles, though these are connected graphs, right? So even though your graph may not be connected. You can always break it up into different pieces, which are themselves connected graphs. And so these are usually called the connected components. Right, and so in the picture above, there are, there are two connected components, which are circled in red uh, for G2. Right, and so how do you, how do you define these things rigorously? Well, well, notice that, that each, each component or each piece of the graph that's been circled in red is a, a connected subgraph of the original graph. Right, so they're the connected subgraphs of G, uh, which are not proper subgraphs. Like, so you don't want them to, right? So for example, if I, if I go to G1, remember G1 is connected. If I circled off this triangular region, and ignored everything else, well, that's still a connected subgraph, but I don't want to say that's a connected component because it is connected to another piece of the graph. So we have to add in one extra condition in order to avoid that, that issue. So you don't just want connected subgraphs of G, you want to make sure that they're also not contained in any larger connected subgraph in G, uh, right? So we want connected subgraphs that, that are not proper sub, proper subgraphs of a larger connected subgraph in G. Uh, right, so in, in order to, I mean, in order to write down this definition rigorously, you have to be very careful and, and technical. But geometrically, I think the, the notion of connected components is very clear, right? So you just look at the picture of the graph and they're just the different pieces that are not linked to one another. Uh, we just need this extra technical condition to avoid the, the scenario I, I mentioned uh, a minute ago. Okay. Right, and so where would, where would these show up in practice? Well, you can think of one way to that graph show up a lot is, is by modeling uh, computer networks, for example. And so the different connected components may be, for example, private or local networks, which are not connected to the internet or something like that. So they're, they are graphs, but they're localized graphs that are not connected to the larger graph. Right, so if you consider the graph of all computer connections in the world, there's going to be some subgraphs which are connected components 
which are disconnected from the rest of the network, right? Okay. Okay, and so this is all for, for undirected graphs. So how do we modify this for, for the directed case? Well, you have to be a little careful because you want you want the the notion of, of the connectedness here to take into account the directions of the graph. And so let's suppose we have we have a directed graph. Uh, and so there, there are two different notions of connectivity in this case. Uh, so the first is uh, is a sort of the, the direct modification of the previous definition. So G is said to be, in this case, strongly connected. Right, so the first notion is like a stronger notion uh, or strongly connected. If there is a path from, right, so if for any, right, so if there is a, path, meaning a, a directed path, right? The path that takes into account the directions from, from X to Y and Y to X for any, any two X and Y in, in the vertex set. That are, that are different, right? So X not equal Y. Uh, right, and so notice that I'm requiring two different things, right? I don't just want to pass from X to Y, I want to pass from Y to X as well. And since, since the graph is directed, these two things may be different, right? We've seen plenty of examples. If you go back to, to the, the example we looked at earlier today uh, for directed paths, you have an example where there's a path from one vertex to another, but the, there's not a path in the reverse direction, right? Uh, right, so this is, this is strong connectedness. Uh, and so what it will, this is the strong connectedness. What is, what is the weaker form? Well, the graph is said to be uh, weakly connected. If it's connected geometrically, meaning if you look at the picture, it's connected in the, in the, in the sense we talked about previously. Uh, so uh, just if there is a, an undirected path Uh, between any two vertices and and so what do I mean? I mean you have to forget that it's a directed graph, pretend that there's no directions. And then use the previous definition and that's what this means, right? So pretend. Right. And so what are some, some quick examples? Uh, right, so let me first draw a picture of a strongly connected graph. So this will be a graph with three vertices. Uh, right, and so I have, I have an edge connecting X to Y, edge connecting Y to Z, and an edge connecting Z to X. Well, you can check that this is strongly connected. Right, so there's a path from, from X to Y if I just go X to Y. Is there a path from Y to X? Well, yes, I have to go Y to Z and then Z to X, right? Is there a path from X to Z? Yes, I go from X to Y and then Y to Z. And also there's a path from Z to X because I can just travel directly from Z to X. And then finally, there's a path from Y to Z because Y is connected to Z by an edge. And there's also a path from Z to Y because I can travel Z to X to Y, right? So this is strongly connected. Uh, what's an example that, that's weakly connected and not strongly connected? Uh, okay, so let me draw that. Right, so here I'm going to reverse one of the arrows or a few of the arrows. So this is an example of a graph that is, that is weakly connected, but not strongly connected. Uh, right. 
Right, so why is this weakly connected? But well, remember for weak connectedness, we just pretend that the arrows aren't there. And then clearly this is a connected, if we pretend it's an undirected graph, it's clearly connected because it's in one piece. So therefore it's weakly connected. Uh, however, why is it not, not strongly connected? Uh, for example, there's no path from, from X to Z, right? So. Right, so even though it's weakly connected, I can't, I can't get from X to Z and therefore it's not, it's not strongly connected. Uh, right, so no, when I say path, I'm, I'm again imagining that there's directions. So there's no directed path from X to Z. Uh, Okay, and so that's that's a bit again a basic introduction into connectedness. So there's there's some more more complicated properties related to connectedness of graphs, which are in, in the textbook, which we're going to skip for now. Uh, we may come back to, to some more some more properties of connectedness if we if we need to use them. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, right. So so one thing I want I want to point out uh, related to what we what we've been talking about today and and, and the previous lecture. Well, you can use properties of paths and actually more precisely circuits to, to tell whether or not two graphs are isomorphic. Uh, right, so uh, right. in particular, you can use information, as I just said, let me just write this out uh, about circuits. To study isomorphisms between graphs. Here, let me just write graph isomorphisms. Uh, so, what's a, what's an example of how this would how this would arise? Uh, well, let's say I have one graph which I'll call G, which will look something like this. And another graph, which I'll call H, which will be very similar, except uh, I'm gonna slightly modify what the edges look like or the edge connections. So it's gonna look something like, like this. And so the question is, well, are, are these isomorphic? Uh, and so if you look, well, they have the same number of vertices and, and the same number of edges. So there's no, like immediately obvious reason that they're that they're not uh, isomorphic, and if you I mean if you look at the different degrees of, of their respective vertices, they all actually have the same degree. So at this point, if you go back to what we talked about in the previous lecture, you may be inclined to think that they are isomorphic, and you would start trying to find an isomorphism. Uh, it turns out, however, that that you won't be able to find an isomorphism because the answer in this case is no. Uh, and so why is this the case? Well, I'm gonna write this as, as a theorem. And this is a theorem which you'll prove in your next homework. It's one of the exercises in the book. Uh, so suppose uh, G and H are, are isomorphic graphs. Uh, well, if H has a circuit meaning a, a path that begins and ends at, at the same the same point. Maybe I can put simple here as well if you want to. Uh, so if H has a simple circuit of length K, for example, then G also has to have a simple circuit of length K. Right, and so how are we going to how are we going to apply this? Well, if I go back to the, the to H, well here I'm going to outline a simple circuit of length four. Right. Well, if I look at the graph G, there there well there's no simple circuit of length four in this picture. Right. And so, I mean, well, what is the proof of this theorem? It's, you're going to use the fact that if they're isomorphic, then the, the different edge relationships have to correspond 
uh, to one another between the two graphs. Uh, right, so for the for the proof, it'll it'll be in, in your next homework. Uh, right, right and, and so the the again, but the the important point uh, is that you can use you can use properties about circuits to detect whether or not two graphs are are isomorphic. Uh, and so, right, so these are so having a circuit or a simple circuit of a certain length. Is a is an example of something that's called a, a graph or uh, wait, let me let me write this differently. Right, so so circuits are what's called graph or graph isomorphism invariants. And so, what does that mean? It, it means that well, if the invariants are things that if two graphs are isomorphic and one graph has these properties, then the other graph has to have them as well, right? They're conditions that are preserved by the isomorphism. And so other examples are, are, are number of vertices, uh, edge relationships, uh, degree of vertices. Uh, these are also invariants. Uh, and so having a, a circuit of a certain length is, a, is another example. Great. Okay, and then, right, so for the, the last part of, of the lecture, I did want to, to mention a little bit about, about counting the number of paths between uh, vertices. And so this, this is, right, so you're, you, you may be given a particular graph and you may want to know, given one vertex and another, how many different paths are there from, from one to another, right? For example, maybe you have a computer network that's set up and you, you want to make sure that between any two given computers, you have lots of paths in case some of the network, in, in case some of the connections fail for, for some reason, right? So you want to, may want to make sure that there are at least like five paths between any two uh, vertices or something like that. Well, what's a what's an efficient way to actually count how many paths there are? Uh, well, it turns out that you can you can use the adjacency matrix of a graph. Uh, and so this is going to require a, a very limited amount of, of linear algebra. Uh, basically, you have to know how to multiply matrices. And so if you if you don't know how to multiply matrices or you haven't thought about this in a while, that's uh, that's okay. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna test about this or ask you any homework questions about this, but I did wanna just mention it because it is it is a little bit important and some people may be interested. Uh, right, so it requires a little bit of matrix algebra. Right, and so well, well, how does this work? Let me look at let me look at an example uh, picture. So this is x, y, uh, z, and t, and so this is my graph, which I'll call G. Uh, well, what is the adjacency matrix for this graph? Remember, uh, let me just write it out. I'll use this order: x, y, uh, z, t. Uh, right, and so the, the matrix for this graph is, I'm just going to copy it over. You can, you can double check this. Right, and so notice that, that the entry in this matrix, for example, if I look at, at the entry, let's say Y, Z, well, this is the, the number of, of edges. I mean, it, it's just one because there's an edge between Y and Z. So you can think of this as the number of edges between Y and Z, which is equal to one, right? And similarly, well, I have no, I have no edge between, for example, T and Y. So the entry T then Y is, is also the number of edges between uh, T and Y, right? And so, well, what what is what does it mean to have an edge between two vertices? That's the same as a as a path of length one, 
right? And so one way to think about the adjacency matrix is counting the number of paths of length one between the, the respective vertices, right? So the, the adjacency matrix counts number of paths of length one. And so what we want to do is use this observation to make this more general. Like we don't want just the number of paths of length one. Well, maybe we want the number of paths of length five or the number of paths of length 10 or something like that. And so you can do this using the following theorem. Uh, so suppose G is a graph and let me label the vertices. We have to give them some labeling if we're going to use adjacency matrices. So let's say they're labeled V1, V2 up to Vn. Uh, right, and so what you're going to do is form the, the adjacency matrix. And so I'm also going to look at the, the rth power of this matrix, right? So multiply the matrix by itself, r times. So you have to know how to multiply matrices in order to do this. Again, if you, if you don't remember how to do that, or you've never learned it, that, that's OK. I, I won't test you about any of this. It's just a, an interesting point. Uh, and so the theorem is that the entry, so the ij entry of this matrix, meaning row i and column j, is the number of paths between vi and vj. So, so that's the, the theorem, right? So, so how would you how would you test for you'd pick say v v four and v five, and you want to know the number of paths between v four and v five on, on your graph of a of, of sorry of length r sorry of a particular length. Right? So this is the number of paths of length r between uh, between these two vertices. Right, so for example, you pick V4 and V5 and you wanna know the number of paths of length eight between V4 and V5. There may be zero or there may be a few, you don't know. Well, you calculate the adjacency matrix for your graph, you multiply that matrix by itself eight times and then you look at, at entry four comma five and that will tell you the number of paths. Uh, right, and, and so what's, what's the basic, the proof idea? for why this works, well, you're going to, to use induction on R, right? And so what's the base case? Well, in the base case, you would want to R equal, you can take R equals one as your, as your base case, and we already checked this, right? So the number, what is a path of length one between two vertices? A path of length one is just an edge, so this is okay, right? Because the adjacency matrix already counts one if there's an edge and zero if there's no edge. Right, so the base case is okay. And so then in the induction step, right, so what is the matrix AR? I can write this as AR to the minus one times A, right? And so I can, can assume that the matrix AR to the minus one counts number of paths of length R minus one. Right, in the way discussed in, in, in the theorem, right? So this is the, the induction hypothesis. Right, and then I want to I want to show that if I look at at a particular entry of this matrix, that that it counts the number of paths of length r. And so, what is well, what is the entry uh, i j of a r? Well, it's going to be. Let me write it this way. Well, let's suppose that, that AR to the minus one is equal. Well, what are the entries of these? Let me call them BIJ, meaning the entry in row I and column J is this number BIJ, which counts the, the, the number, 
of paths of length r minus one from vi to vj. Right, and so this is from the, the induction hypothesis. Well, what is the, the ij entry of AR? Let me also assume, right, I forgot to label the matrix A. So let me assume that the entries of the matrix A are given by, by AIJ, right? So these are the two important bits of information. And so the AIJ are exactly what we defined last time when we, when we defined the adjacency matrix, right? So this is one if there's an edge between VI and VJ, and AIJ is zero if there's no such edge, right? And so I'm, I'm constructing AR by multiplying the matrix AR minus one by A, and so the ij entry of ar is going to be some combination of these terms. And so if you remember your formula for, for multiplying matrices, you can check that, that the ij entry of ar will be given by this sum. So I have sum from k equals one to n. Uh, well, I'll have bik times akj, right? So I'm taking the uh, ith row of ar minus one, which is given by these bik terms, and I'm taking the dot product of that with the jth column of A, which is given by these, these AKJ terms, uh, right? And so I can write this as, for example, BI1, uh, A1J plus BI2, A2J, and, and so on, until I hit uh, BIN, ANJ, right? Right, and so, Let's just look at the, at the first term. What does this represent? So this represents the, the number of paths by induction. This is the number of paths of length r minus one from vi to v1. On the other hand, this quantity is equal to uh, one if there's a path from uh, v1 to vj and it's equal to zero if not, right? And so let's assume that there is a path, there is a, sorry, not path, edge. Let me correct this to edge. So let's assume that there is an edge from V1 to Vj. Well then, if Bi1 is not zero, that tells me how many paths I have from, from Vi to V1, right? So let's say this is Vi, or sorry, V1. And this is, let me change the color, right? So let's say this is V1 and this is Vj. And I'm assuming I have a, a, an edge from V1 to Vj, right? So I'm assuming A1j is equal to one, uh, right? Well, if B, Bi1 is not zero, that means that I have, well, I have Bi out here somewhere and there's some path uh, of length R minus one from vi to v1 which is which is uh, which i know because vi1 is not zero and so if this term is not zero then it tells me that i have in particular i have some path of length r right because r minus one I, it takes r minus one edges to get from vi to v1 and then you add one more to get to vj and moreover it counts how many such paths there are that start at vi right or sorry, not, not that start at VI, that, that, that contain V1, or that, that end at V1 right before they hit VJ, right? That hit V1 before VJ, uh, right? And so this does not count the total number of paths of length R minus one, because for example, maybe there's another, or, or length R, because maybe there's another path of length R that goes from, for example, maybe V2 to VJ, if there's an edge from V2 to VJ. And in order to take, in order to understand how many paths look like this, you have to look at the second term, you also have to look at the third term and so on. And so when, when you add these all up together, uh, you count the total number, number of paths of length R uh, using the induction hypothesis, uh, right? And so that was maybe, maybe I went through that a little, a little too quickly. Uh, if, you're, if you're confused, you can also look at the write-up in the book or ask me during the, any of the, the upcoming meetings and maybe I'll, I'll go through the, this in a little bit more detail if you're interested, uh, right? So the, the main thing though is not, not knowing this proof very well because I'm not gonna ask you about it. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, what you should know though is, or what, what may be helpful to know 
is, is this theorem that, that if you multiply the adjacency matrix by itself r times, it will count the number of paths of, of length r from any two, any two, between any, any two vertices. All right, so that's, that's it for today. Thank you.